Good evening, world historians. Just a short video today to conclude with the uh, First World War, the Great War. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, November the 11th, 1918, the guns fell silent on the Western Front, bringing to a close what at that time had been the deadliest war in European history, had destroyed and later in large portions of the continent. And when we finished uh, last time, I mentioned that the United States itself, though entering late into the war, had suffered from um, over 112,000 deaths. Um, about half of those were actually in combat, and the remainder were as a result of various illnesses, um, dysentery, uh, tuberculosis, other diseases which were common at the time. Um, but still, the number was very high. And of course, what was happening in 1918 over a hundred years ago now, but was really the last major global pandemic uh, to sweep the world, which of course has resonance today. So in 1918, we found a new virus beginning to sweep in the trenches where soldiers were fighting and dying in these appalling conditions. This unnamed illness killed many Americans and other troops and incapacitated even more. Uh, as it swept into the global community, becoming a pandemic, Wartime reporting restrictions kept this virus hidden from the general public, but it was in Spain, which was a neutral country, where no such restrictions applied, that news of this virus first started to circulate in the global media. And this is why it soon became known as the Spanish flu. So when a second, more deadly wave uh, started to hit in 1919, the Spanish flu, as it became known, would go on to inflict one third of the human population and claim some 50 million lives, which was more than the Great War itself. So that's just a little bit of a, a, a kind of context there. This is a situation that was exacerbated, actually born out of the Great War, the fighting in the trenches, which of course was a perfect condition for viruses and diseases to spread. But when we move beyond the First World War to its aftermath, we have um, just outside Paris, France, the Palace of Versailles, which was the uh, the former home of the French kings, where the big four allied powers met in 1919 to uh, negotiate and to settle a peace treaty to end the First World War. And this was, you can see them here, uh, left to right, David Lloyd George, who is the Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, the Italian Prime Minister Orlando, uh, Georges Clemenceau, who was nicknamed uh, Le Tigre or the Tiger. Uh, it was the President of France. And towering above them, you have the figure of Woodrow Wilson, who was the President of the United States, uh, US, who committed to the Allied effort at the end of the war with uh, some 5 million troops and had played a decisive role in the conclusion of the Great War. Now, uh, two countries or two nations um, who you might have expected to have been at the, t the table were not present at Versailles. The first one, um, of course, was the Germans, because the Germans were uh, really the recipients of the peace treaty. They were signatories of the peace treaty, uh, but were not themselves being the uh, defeated country negotiating at the table. Um, the second country that was absent was uh, Russia, or as it then had become the Soviet Union. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, next time, but the Soviet Union had actually come out of the Russian Revolution in 1917, which was itself a consequence of the First World War. The Russians had actually, under Vladimir Lenin, signed a separate peace treaty with Germany, so they were not um, in 1919 at the negotiating table with the other big four members. Now, um, Woodrow Wilson had been pushing for what he termed peace without victory. In other words, Wilson's goal his uh, vision, if you like, was for a return to peace, uh, but without imposing victorious, um, uh, you know, kind of allied uh, vengeance on the defeated German uh, nation, which was the main loser, obviously, of the First World War. However, the other uh, three powers, particularly the French, led by Clemenceau, uh, wanted to impose sweeping and uh, punishing reparations on Germany. And so you can see with the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, in which the German government, incidentally not the German government, which had gone to war in the First World War because the Kaiser had stepped down from power, had abdicated, um, and a new provisional government was in place. Um, but this treaty was imposed on Germany with uh, territorial provisions, uh, the reduction of the German 
um, domestic territory, but also the loss of its colonies, which had been a contributing factor to the First World War, uh, the scramble for Africa. Um, and then military restrictions on the German military. There was also a demilitarized zone that was imposed uh, in the Rhineland, the Rhine River being the western boundary between uh, Germany and then to the west, France. Uh, the idea being that if you um, demilitarize that borderland, uh, it would in the future prevent or discourage Germany from uh, ever again attempting to invade France. Now, of course, with the rise of Adolf Hitler on the horizon, we can see how successful or unsuccessful the Treaty of Versailles turned out to be. Um, perhaps the most contentious of the clauses of the Versailles Treaty was the so-called War Guilt Clause, uh, which pointed the finger of blame um, exclusively to the German government or its successor government and um, imposed something on the re region of $32 billion uh, in reparations to the Allied powers, uh, which the German government uh, was unable to pay back. In fact, until if you added interest onto that, uh, the payments continued until the 21st century, until almost our own time. Um, so this was a crippling blow for Germany economically. Uh, its economy was already in ruins because of the First World War, but it also had to pay a huge sum of money back in those days, $32 billion in reparations to the Allied powers. And also to accept... Uh, the sole exclusive guilt for uh, beginning the First World War, despite the fact, of course, that it had begun in Sarajevo with the uh, Serbian assassin. Um, so finally, uh, the first article of the Treaty of Versailles uh, would also bear out uh, the wishes of Woodrow Wilson to establish a League of Nations. Now, the League of Nations was the forerunner of today's United Nations, obviously a, a different organization, but the same idea, the idea of a multinational um, negotiating body that could mediate uh, future diplomatic arguments and prevent uh, conflict on the scale of World War I ever happening again. And as we can see, of course, with World War II, the League of Nations failed centrally in its mission. Unfortunately, uh, when Woodrow Wilson returns to the United States, having uh, negotiated the Treaty of Versailles and bearing it in his hands, so to speak, and presents it before Congress. Uh, the Congress of the United States actually rejects the Treaty of Versailles. They override the Treaty of Versailles, and it's rejected um, in the American Congress as a piece of legislation because of, partly because of at least the League of Nations that uh, Americans at that time did not want to get involved uh, in future European conflicts and certainly did not want to be part of this new and strange uh, multinational um, organization, which uh, at that time was seen as, as, a, as a product of Woodrow Wilson's uh, negotiations. Um, so ironically, if you like, the League of Nations is almost dead on arrival uh, on account of the, the rising isolationism in the United States, which will carry on until 1930s when you see the rise of Hitler um, and Imperial Japan starting to threaten uh, US interests in the Pacific. So we will come back to those themes uh, next week, but I hope you're all well and have a great weekend, everyone.